I would say okay or whatever. Yes, yeah, we say okay now the recording is in progress. So it's good to see you. I'm glad you can uh, sit in this afternoon for our, our training and equipping hour. So let's start with prayer. Let's pray. Holy and loving God, you bless us so richly, so abundantly and Certainly these beautiful fall days have been an evidence of, of your blessing upon us. And yet we confess, we confess that often we grab your blessings to keep them for ourselves, that uh, often we hoard your blessings, we gather them up and we forget that we are meant to in turn be a blessing to others. And this is especially true when we talk about things like money and property. Oh, Lord, be with us. Open our hearts and our minds. Help us to release a little bit of what you have given to us so that we can be a better blessing to our neighbors, so that we can indeed show love, the love you have for us, the love we're asked to share with all. Be with us in this time and in all the ministry that we engage day in and day out. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Fun topic today. Woo! Finances, <laughs> finance committees, and trustees. Woo! <laughs> And the reason that we're, we're touching on this today is because this is one of the areas I have been getting a lot of questions about. Um, and so since I'm getting questions, I figure it's good for me to brush up on the answers, but also then just to provide an opportunity uh, to touch base on these things. And if you don't know yet, uh, you should know that even though we're gonna to go to the book of order for a lot of this, we need to start with the Bible because of course we are, we are people, followers of Jesus Christ, gathered together as the body of Christ. So the Bible um, has a lot to say about money and wealth and property. Uh, some of the stories that came to mind, and this is not an exhaustive list in any way, shape, or form, is that we're reminded that all that we have is first a gift from God, that God, who is the creator of all, the Lord of heaven and earth, then showers upon us blessings that we receive. We didn't make this world. We are participants in it. We are in some ways co-creators in it, but God is first and we, we receive. So that is a clear biblical image all the way, all the way through the Bible. Um, we see several invitations to give it away. And the, the most obvious one is Jesus' encounter with the rich young ruler when he came and said, I've kept the law, what else must I do? And Jesus says, sell everything you have, give the money to the poor and follow me. There are other invitations. There are invitations to let go of what we received, invitations to trust in God and not trust in, in things like property and wealth. Um, but probably the one we're most familiar with is Jesus and the rich young man. But don't be fooled, it's not about being rich. It's not only those who are wealthy who are invited to give away. It is, it is all of us as followers of Jesus. All the way through the Bible, there's an expectation of stewardship. And that of course links to the invitation to give it away. And it links back to the reminder that we have received these gifts from God. And that invitation to stewardship shows up in the beginning, right at the beginning of Genesis. So we are meant to steward the blessings we've received, not gather them for ourselves, not hoard them away, but to practice a stewardship. Um, 
And that means a use of gifts. Uh, and those are to be used, no surprise, for mission and ministry in the purpose of loving God with all of who we are, loving ourselves, loving our neighbors. We are meant to use these gifts in order to further God's kingdom. Thy will be done, thy kingdom come, is what we pray. And so when we talk about stewarding the gifts that we've received, it is for a particular purpose. It's not just for anything that comes across our minds. We have direction for how we are invited to, to use God's good gifts. And any list on money wouldn't be complete uh, without the reminder that the Bible also talks about wealth and money and property with some caution. Um, we are reminded that Jesus talked more about money than prayer. And a lot of those conversations were, were cautionary to be careful, you know, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, right? Not, not wealth on earth. The love of money is the root of all evil. Those kinds of lessons and sayings remind us that it can be easy for our hearts and minds to be captured by the, the need to gather more and hoard more. But, but a Christian understanding of money and wealth and property is, is rooted in God's grace and abundance, is rooted in the knowledge that we have enough, and the one who calls us equips us, that God will indeed provide for our needs so that we may be faithful. So all of that is the foundation for what the Book of Order says and how we are then led as churches, as sessions, as trustees, if we have trustees, to think about Things like budgets and endowments and special funds and property. So, oh, Dave, yeah. Oh, you're muted. The fourth bullet to be used for the purpose of mission and ministry. Yeah. Um, sometimes people interpret that as money being uh, necessary and sufficient for mission and ministry. And I don't believe that either is true. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, we don't need money to be faithful. And, and some of the most creative churches when it comes to mission and ministry are the ones that don't have financial resources. They can't just pay for it. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you for reminding us of that. So let's go to the Book of Order, um, but we're going to start with the F section, the Foundations of Presbyterian Polity. It's the, the first section that was added several years ago now, and it, it reminds us of the foundation of our polity, just like it says. Uh, so to have this in front of us, that we are reminded that the church is the body of Christ. It doesn't belong to us. It doesn't rely on us. The church is not, um, is not on our backs. It is the body of Christ. And that Christ gives to the church all the gifts necessary to be his body, most of which are not money and property. Um, and then we are called to demonstrate those gifts to the world. And so this, this language, a community of faith, entrusting itself to God alone, even at the risk of losing its life. And in the context of money and property, I, I especially want to pull out that phrase. Uh, sometimes we feel like we need to build up a fund for a quote unquote rainy day, for the future, for someday that is yet to come. And we lose sight of the ministry and mission that we're being invited into now. 
uh, we're being, we lose sight of the possibilities and we're afraid of what might happen in the future if we don't have access to money or property, which means we can often be frozen in the present and unable to respond to our neighbors. We see this with property as well. We can't, we can't let an outside group in because what if they break something? What if they mark up the walls? What if it's not perfect anymore? What if they move something in the kitchen? <laughs> we make decisions based on those fears, the fears of damage, the fear that we might lose something in the property instead of paying attention to the opportunity to engage in ministry. Now, there are other reasons to build up an endowment or savings. There are other reasons to say no to a group that wants to use the building. But it shouldn't be about the fear for the future. It should be rooted in the purpose of mission and ministry. So this, this language, God is making a new creation. We're to be a community of hope, a community of love, and a community of witness. If we can hold on to these things, when we begin to talk about budgets and finances and property, if we can hold on to hope, love, and witness that those are the marks of the body of Christ, those are the marks of our community, we might find ourselves approaching those conversations a little differently. Also from uh, section F, we have the great ends of the church. Um, and in the sample articles of incorporation that we are uh, sharing from the Presbytery of Baltimore, they have the great ends of the church in those articles of incorporation for the state of Maryland. What is the purpose of this organization? Here it is. It's the great ends of the church proclamation of the gospel, shelter, nurture, spiritual fellowship of the children of God, maintenance of divine worship, preservation of the truth, promotion of social righteousness, exhibition of the kingdom of heaven to the world. Nothing about how much money we need to have in the bank. Nothing about what kind of building we should have, how big it should be, what kind of classrooms it needs. These, these are action items. Uh, in a previous presbytery, I served in one of the members of a committee believed that every church should have at least X amount of money in the bank. And if they didn't, they weren't a viable church. And the church I was pastoring at the time, we had no money in the bank. In fact, actually, we went through a period where we couldn't pay our bills. We literally could not pay our bills. It was a tough time, but we were faithful in so many ways. We were known in the larger community as a place where everyone was welcome. We were known as a place where people could come and find community. And we made it through. We made it through. We were able to catch up on our bills. But that one person's notion that the money in the bank determined the viability of the church well, it's just dead wrong. There's nothing to do with that. So let's move to the form of government, to the nitty gritty stuff. We have to keep the foundation that what we have are gifts from God. Those gifts are God, gifts from God are meant to be used for mission and ministry. And we have some direction for what that means in the great ends of the church and the foundations of Presbyterian polity. But what's the nitty gritty? What does it mean uh, when the rubber hits the road? So first of all, from G30106, we have this paragraph on administration of mission, that the funding of mission similarly demonstrates the unity and interdependence of the church. The failure of any part of the church to participate in the stewardship of the mission of the whole church diminishes that unity and interdependence. 
So some of the first language we have in our form of government around funding, around finances, is about mission. And it is about how being engaged in funding mission points to our unity, points to the ways that we are dependent upon one another. And in the next paragraph, it gives effective witness to the world. So the ways we engage in our finances are part of our witness. Let me say that again. The ways we engage our finances are part of our witness. So if we have meetings where people argue over cents, as in dollars and cents, and focus on trying, trying to keep as much money on hand and not stepping out in faith, and you see where my bias is, that's a witness. It's a witness about where, where we put our dependence, about who we rely on. Do we rely on God? Do we trust one another? Do we believe in the mission and ministry? Or do we feel like we have to rely on ourselves? Do we feel like we have to pull together all of our resources and hold them close? Because if we don't, we won't have anything. And I guess, I guess I should say really clearly, the experience of pastoring a church that was unable to pay its bills for a few months helped reorient my sense of finances and property, helped reorient for me what being faithful can look like when there wasn't any money to fight about. <laughs> It truly wasn't. And in some ways, when we stop worrying about it, when we acknowledge this is the reality and we're going to have to make some decisions moving forward, but we're not, we're not going to worry about it. That's when ministry opened up and that's when things began to turn around. So that's an experience that I, that I had and that definitely helped me shift my sense of, of money and ministry together. So moving on in section G, the form of government, um, <clears throat> we have this language about committees and commissions. And the reason I'm bringing this up is one of the places of uh, potential conflict and struggle uh, is around our, our committees, our budget committees, finance committees, whatever you want to call them, any kind of committee that has been set up to deal with finances or financial matters. And this, this language is, is overarching. So when the Book of Order uses the word council, that means session at the congregational level, or it means presbytery or synod or general assembly. Those are the councils of the church. So for our purposes, we're gonna talk about sessions. Sessions are the council, the, the place where the authority resides in a congregation. So councils, sessions may designate by their own rule, such committees and commissions as they deem necessary and helpful for the accomplishment of the mission of the church. Here's the important thing that I bolded. A committee shall study and recommend action or carry out decisions already made by a council. It shall make a full report to the council that created it and its recommendations shall require action by that body. So what does this mean? Committees in congregations and committees at the presbytery level as well, only exist by action of the session. They, they don't exist on their own. They don't, in fact, at the congregation level, there are no required committees. We have the required 
tasks, the, the great ends of the church, the things that we require, but we don't require committees. We require a session. And the session has the responsibility to, by their own rule, designate committees to take on some of that work. But the committees always, always are subservient to the session. They always report to the session and the only action they can take is action that the session has already allowed. Now, a session could set up in a committee um, guidance so that a committee can undertake ongoing action like a worship committee. The session could task a worship committee with the responsibility of providing the elements for communion Sundays. So they've been given that task. The section has taken that action. And that means the worship committee doesn't have to come back to the session every time there's communion and ask for permission. But the session has the right at any time to say, you know, our mission and ministry needs something different. And so we're going to resume the authority. We're going to take back the authority to make this decision while we discern where we're being called. The same is true for finance committees. A session may task a finance committee with preparing a budget on an annual basis, but it is the session that determines the budget. The finance committee can come with a document completely ready to go. The session has the right to say, actually, we, we want to steward our resources in a different way because that authority resides in the session of a Presbyterian church. So pay attention to that shell language. A committee shall study and recommend action or carry out decisions. It shall make a full report. So this is one of the, the, the touchy places that I've seen uh, in lots of congregations across the PCUSA is a blurring of the lines between session and committee. So regardless of the committee in the church, the session has full responsibility can vote to give a portion of that responsibility for particular purposes, but always has the ability to resume that responsibility whenever the mission and ministry of the church requires it. Any questions about that? Yeah, Dave. To be specific about finance, supposing that the session has approved a budget, which has a line item for say, Brother Al's orphanage, Mm -hmm. And the committee then is authorized without further action by the session to write the check to Brother Al's orphanage because it's already in the budget, correct? Usually, yeah. Um, like I said, I pastored a church where we, we had to make decisions about the timing of those checks. <laughs> but yeah, if, if it is in the budget, and session is the body that approves the budget. Um, further conversation other than timing and then signing off on the check shouldn't be necessary. Now, if there's a question about whether Brother Al's orphanage is doing the, the ministry that they're supposed to be doing, that's a deeper question. But yeah, I mean, if it is in the budget as presented and passed by the session, it's good to go, generally speaking. Yeah. Remember I said line item, mm -hmm. supposing there is just a block grant to mission for say $500, does the mission committee then have the scope to decide to whom the $500 or $50 a piece goes without yeah. further session action? If the session has given them that authority, remember in this, in this uh, part of the book of order, we're reminded that a committee has to make a full report. So 
a session could say, could designate to a mission committee, there's $500, you decide where it goes and let us know what you've decided. A session could do that and take that action, put it in the minutes so you've got it. <laughs> or the session could say, we have this much money in the budget. We'd like the mission committee to come back with some recommendations that we, then we'll make a decision on. Both are appropriate, but both require action of the session. It's not enough for the mission committee to just say, hey, we spent the money. <laughs> Yeah. All right, next paragraph, um, still under the session. Uh, so we have these composition and responsibilities uh, and the C section is focusing on nurturing the covenant community of disciples of Christ. And I, I just pulled out the section specifically looking at uh, finances and property and you see how much is there. Jesus talked about money a lot because human beings fight about money a lot. Let, let's be honest. And so in this section of the book of order, the bulk of the paragraph about nurturing the covenant community of disciples of Christ is about finances and property. But again, this is the session's responsibility. It is the session that has the responsibilities that shall include encouraging graces of generosity and stewardship, managing physical property for the furtherance of mission, directing the ministry of deacons, trustees, and all organizations in the congregation. The session is the buck stops here group for congregation, employing administrative staff, leading the congregation participating in mission. Again, the session can form committees, uh, form task groups, working groups to work on these things. You know, maybe you have a group that every year is tasked with pulling together an amazing stewardship campaign. The session has the authority to do that. But the final authority resides in the session. It's one of the reasons why we are so serious about the nominating committee process and the election process, that the, the session, the elders on session have been nominated and elected by the congregation. By book of order, they should have been trained for their work, and then they are ordained and installed to that work. It is serious work. And so there is a, a high level of responsibility in, in a well-functioning session. And this is a piece of it. So let's look at finances. I wanna make sure we have plenty of time uh, for questions. Um, so again, straight from the book of order, I added the bold to pull out the shall language. Still under the section about the session, finances. In addition to those responsibilities described in G30113, the session shall prepare and adopt a budget and determine the distribution of the congregation's benevolences. So to Dave's question, the session can ask a mission committee, come back with recommendations for how our mission money is spent. Or, you know, you know who we usually uh, support, so you make sure that we continue to support them. But the authority resides in the session. It shall authorize offerings for Christian purposes. So the session has the ability to take up additional offerings based on the mission and ministry of the congregation. The session shall account for the proceeds of such offering and their disbursement. There's that, that uh, you know, financial management piece that we need to have good, um, good financial management and practices there. The session shall provide full information to the congregation concerning its decisions in such matters. And that's important to remember because while the session has this high level of authority, this high level of um, ability to act, they are then accountable 
to the congregation that elected them. So while the session um, always has the authority to uh, establish and adopt a budget, it also has the responsibility of reporting to the congregation information about those decisions. Um, <clears throat> being able to be transparent about our finances is one of our values in the church. And so while the session has this authority, it also has a responsibility to keep good records, to be clear about the uses of finances and to share that information, to make sure that information is available. Continuing in that same paragraph, uh, and this is all the same section, it just got really small on the slide, so I cut it up. Um, the session shall elect a treasurer. It's the session that elects the treasurer, not the congregation. And the session decides the term. Um, the session supervises the work of the treasurer or as you see, can delegate that supervision to a board of deacons or trustees. But even in that delegation, the session retains primary authority, can take that delegation back. Um, those in charge of various congregational funds shall report at least annually to the session, more often as requested. Session may, there's a little may provide by rule for standard financial practices, but shall in no case fail to observe the following guidelines. Um, and sometimes, sometimes this can get a little tricky, but these, these are in the book of order for us. All offerings shall be counted and recorded by at least two duly appointed persons or by one fidelity bonded person. So that means that it is the session's responsibility to appoint those who count the offerings. Different churches do this in different ways. Um, some churches have a, a rotating group of people, but this is part of that responsibility that the session has. Those who count should be appointed to that. It's a way of holding responsible. It's a way of making sure that um, it's not just anybody who shows up at the right time and says, well, I'm available, I can help. There's, there's a level of accountability there when we deal with finances. Um, the third thing, second thing in those shells, financial books and records adequately reflect all financial transactions and they shall be kept and shall be open. So sometimes treasurers will be um, uncomfortable about just sharing the books. But in our polity, money is supposed to be transparent. Of course, an anonymous donor is different, but, but keeping the books, tracking expenses, tracking offerings, those things are supposed to be open. Um, and it's, it's one of those red flags. If, if you have somebody or if a church has somebody um, in charge of money or interacting with money and finances who refuses to share uh, reports or delays reports or whose reports are um, consistently incomplete, it's time for conversation. Um, we never want to suspect people of, of mismanagement of funds, but we also know that not-for-profit organizations like churches uh, are often targets. Um, so it's not about accusing somebody. It's not about saying, what are you doing? But it is about saying, we have a responsibility to uh, review the books, to review the finances, to be able to see and know how we are being good stewards. And if you ever need backup, it's right here in the shell language, because shall in the book of order means you have to do it. There's no wiggle room. 
you can try to find wiggle room, but really honestly, there's not supposed to be any. Um, and then the third thing here is periodic, no less than annual reports of all financial activities. You can, <clears throat> as a session, you can set some additional guidelines. Uh, for instance, uh, one church I served um, created an audit committee. And so every year, uh, it was an audit committee of three people. So it was basically uh, three people who were tasked with the work of reviewing, doing the financial review of the books every um every spring, you know, March, April, once uh, things closed, once the finances closed down for the previous year. And so that was something that congregation did. You know, session may provide by rule for standard financial practices of the congregation. That congregation created an audit committee. That audit committee reported to the session. So there are other things you can do in terms of managing finances, in terms of meeting these requirements. Um, but here you have the very minimum requirements around offerings, around financial books and records, um, and around the work of a, a treasurer. All right. Can I, can I ask a quick question? Sure. So, so is there been any guidance on um, section A there? I mean, we have two people counting, but since COVID started, I mean, everyone's giving online direct deposit, like our, our actual counting that's done by two people is, is a minimal part of our, our, you know, like the donations that, that we get. Yeah. Is, is that, has that been covered anywhere? Like in terms of how to verify, you know, like uh, other modes of, of, of giving? It hasn't um, in, in part because we, we haven't really been able to make changes to the book of order <laughs> since the, the pandemic started. But in general, the way I would interpret that language is those are physical offerings. The thing about online offerings um, is that there is that, that electronic trail. Um, so it might be good to have two people with, um, you know, access to that, you know, depending on what uh, platform you use for online giving, but clearly counting in that scenario is a different thing. It's not that physical going through checks and, and physical money. Um, <clears throat> so that would be my sense of it. If two people have access and can verify with one another that, you know, these are the, the online gifts that we've received and they have been um, applied in the appropriate places. You know, if they've been sent in for general offering or for, a uh, special mission to have that that double check. I mean, that's the other reason to have two people. Does that make sense? It does. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, we're yes, all still learning. Cindy, for us, it's the same. We whether it comes to us by check or cash, right, or in an envelope, or, or by the mail, or whether it's PayPal or some mm -hmm. other online source, um, we realize that the total of the PayPal offering the total of that is made up of a bunch of smaller offerings. And in our accounting software, we have to capture all those smaller offerings and the total. And it takes two people to do that, to make sure that the value, the total value of the online offering and the individual values inside that total are properly documented in our software. Otherwise, if you had $10,000 sitting in PayPal and only 9,700 got deposited, uh oh, where's the other 300? Or if somebody said, no, I swear I gave you $600 and you only gave me credit for five, um, you have to, it takes a double. And, and we, at our, at our last church anyway, we did try to make sure that um, we counted the online offering at the same time mm. that we counted the in-person offering. We just printed out the reports and verified it as if it was check or cash. Yeah, yeah. And in some congregations, um, 
some congregations are large enough and have the, the ability to have somebody who is fidelity bonded. Um, and that may be an office administrator. You may have a business administrator who has the, um, the bonding, the insurance basically. Uh, and so that may happen as part of the office side of things. But most of our churches are, you know, relying on volunteers to deal with our money. And, and having that double, um, double presence protects them too. Um, sometimes when we say, you know, look, this is, this is for protection, people here, you don't trust me. But the reality is it protects, it protects them as well. It protects them from um, any kind of, uh, you know, accusation or appearance of impropriety. <clears throat> so let's, we're gonna shift quickly to the trustees, which is a whole nother, whole nother ball of wax. Um, there's a whole section in the Book of Order on incorporation and trustees. And the first church I served had um, what was called a tricameral system. So we had a session, we had a board of trustees, and we had a board of deacons. And I'd never seen that before. It was quite a learning experience for a brand new pastor. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> so this is what the Book of Order tells us where permitted by civil law. Each congregation shall cause a corporation to be formed and maintained. That is fairly straightforward. We have examples of articles of incorporation um, for Maryland. I'm wanting to make sure we have a good sample for Delaware as well. Uh, and of course, the necessary bylaws that go along with that. This is part of our commitment as Presbyterians to be good citizens. I mean, part of our theology, part of our understanding of our mission and ministry is that we interact in the world. We are called to pray for people in um, <clears throat> civil authority, and we are called to be engaged in the actual reality, the actual world around us as good citizens. So incorporating our churches, our congregations is a part of that. Um, it continues, if incorporation is not permitted, which in both of our states it is, so we don't have to worry about that. Um, it, it allows for individual trustees to be elected by the congregation. <clears throat> um, any such individual trustee shall be elected from the congregation's members in the same manner as those elected to the ordered ministries of deacon and ruling elder. So this is only if um, civil law requires a separate board of trustees or because of laws around incorporation require that separation. In both Maryland and Delaware, trustees uh, may be and often are the elders on session. So what happens is because the the session has the authority of the corporation. The session, the elders, fill the role of trustees in terms of the civil authority, in terms of the corporation. Um, so this paragraph continues. It was another long one. The corporation so formed, which is our reality, shall have the following powers. Ah to receive, hold, encumber, manage, and transfer property, real or personal for the congregation. Provided that, wait a minute, buying, selling, mortgaging real property, the trustees shall act only after the approval of the congregation. So this is one of those limits of the authority of the session and or if you have a separate board of trustees. The congregation, is the body that has the right to make decisions around buying, selling, or mortgaging property. Not about the use of property, okay? Buying, selling, mortgaging. 
the session has the right to decide the use of the property, to allow someone to use the sanctuary for a wedding, to allow an outside group to use the fellowship hall for an event. That's the session's responsibility and authority. <clears throat> but if the session wanted to buy the vacant lot next door <coughs> and put up a playground, that buying of property has to go to the congregation. <clears throat> the trustees have um, the authority to deal with deeds of title, Woo! defend title to property, um, <clears throat> which hopefully you never have to do. Yeah, that's no fun. To manage any permanent special funds. So things that are not the budget, permanent special funds, all subject see the bold, all subject to the authority of the session. And under the provisions of the Constitution, the Presbyterian Church USA, <clears throat> hold on to this. I wish I had been more aware of this as a pastor in a church with trustees in session. The powers and duties of the trustees shall not infringe upon the powers and duties of the session. <clears throat> or the board of deacons shall not. So this is another place where there can often be tension and conflict in a church that has a separate board of trustees <clears throat> alongside the session. The congregation has the right to establish a board of trustees or to establish a board of deacons. That is the congregation's right uh, to do that. But the session maintains the authority over the finances of the church and over the property. <clears throat> Similar to the conversation around committees, uh, authority can be delegated and limited authority as described here can be um, vested in a separate board of trustees. But at any time, if the session has an argument that the mission and the ministry of the church requires a different use of the property or finances, they have the primary authority. <clears throat> now, of course, permanent special funds are donor designated. And those, those, uh, those designations came before, uh, you know, before the session or the trustees had access to them. So the, the first church I served had a cemetery. Several of our congregations in Newcastle have cemeteries. And there were special funds related to the cemetery that the trustees of that church oversaw and made decisions about. And that was proper. That was completely proper. Um, when those decisions took primacy over other decisions about the mission and ministry of the church, it was no longer proper. Do, do you see the distinction? <clears throat> so from this, you are not required to have a board of trustees in the states of um, a separate board of trustees in Maryland or Delaware. The elders uh, on session can function in the, the civil requirement for the incorporation. Um, but if you do have a separate board of trustees, the session has more authority than um, you may be exercising, is my, is my experience in the church. Um, <clears throat> so I have one more slide about trustees, but any questions on this piece? All right. Um, and just members of the corporation, because uh, that's something I've gotten some questions about. Um, Not a question, Cindy, but yeah. just like a, a place where this rubbed for me once was um, the trustees felt it was their power to call a meeting of the congregation. Oh. 
and because they were elected by the congregation and they served the congregation and we had to make it clear that no that power sits with the session or the presbytery or a percentage of the congregation itself you as trustees have zero power um, and they weren't really trustees they were officers of the corporation that we had used the word trustee for in the bylaws documents so it, it it conflated and confused some things, but um, just the, there's an example where the session power to call a congregational meeting cannot be infringed upon by those who consider themselves corporate officers or trustees. That's right. That's right. Um, and when I was serving a church in Massachusetts, Massachusetts law meant that there had to be a meeting of the corporation annually. Uh, so my first annual meeting with that congregation, suddenly the clerk of session said, well, now it's time for the corporation to meet. And I was like, what are you talking about? I've never heard of this. That wasn't the case in, in the previous state I had served in. Um, and so that, that might be a piece. Uh, Newcastle Presbytery, we have a separate board of trustees. Um, and at our November meeting, we will have a meeting of the corporation and that will be moderated by the president of the board of trustees. But their power and authority is really limited in those circumstances. <clears throat> it's limited by our book of order. And because of the laws around exercise of religion in the United States, our constitution of the Presbyterian Church USA determines those um, those levels of authority and um, yeah, yeah. So you do have to be eligible for membership in the congregation to be uh, uh, part of, you know, to be elected as a, as a trustee or an officer of the corporation. And in most places you have to be at least 18 years old. You do have to be of legal age to serve as an officer or a trustee. Okay. So here are my key points. Here, here are my key takeaways for you. Whew. Um, great unto the church, my friends. <laughs> all of this, all of this is meant to help us live into our call to love God, to love ourselves, to love our neighbors, to, to be witnesses, to go and make disciples, baptizing the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. If we have all the money in the world and we're not doing our mission and ministry, then we're not being faithful. That, that's the bottom line. Uh, so what has been entrusted to us, what has been received as gifts from God and from those who have gone before, it, it's meant, it's meant for ministry. It's not meant for a rainy day. Um, all committees, oh, look, are responsible to the session. So I started one sentence and then didn't go back. Um, and they have no authority other than the authority the session has given them that the session then has the ability to to take back <clears throat> and trustees according to our book of order as a separate um, board only have particular financial authority over those permanent special funds um, and even that is still subject to the overarching authority of the session which is subject to the mission and ministry of the Church of Jesus Christ. And the trustees and finance committees or property committees, I didn't go a lot into property, but it's, it's tied up in here, <clears throat> do not have unilateral power or authority. Um, so some of those things are uh, tense points in our congregations and that's normal because like I said, when we talk about money and property, it can prick us, it can, it can prick us. What I hope <clears throat> is that if, if there are these places of tension or misunderstanding, that A, this can be helpful. B, don't hesitate to, to reach out to me or to Tracy for some help in, in navigating that uh, because those places of tension today 
can become places of full out conflict um, down the road. So if there are ways to, to help navigate things that aren't working right now, we would love to be a part of that. Uh, and if you need backup, if you need backup as clerks of session, as elders, as ministers, as those who are in leadership, we are here for you. Um, we are here to, to stand by your side and, and help you do the mission and ministry that God's calling you to. Ah, two minutes. Woo, that was a lot. Any last questions? So in November, uh, we have a Presbytery meeting and Thanksgiving, and I am taking a week of vacation. Woohoo! So um, unless you all raise a clamor and say, no, 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 I'm going to cancel the November uh, training hour. <laughs> Any? Okay. I could always um, invite somebody else to do it too, but given everything going on and the start of the holiday season, I thought November could be a break, but we will gather in December. I will pick a lighter topic than stewardship or finances or trustees or anything like that, I promise. Uh, I don't know what it'll be yet, but I promise it'll be lighter and um, we'll have some more time for visiting. So any questions, comments before we uh, close our time today. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And as before, the, the recording and the um, presentation will be available on our website once it's all prepared and Donna's able to, you know, do her magic. All right. Well, my prayers for you is that this evening will be one where there is good food for your bodies, good joy for your hearts, good, good blessings that you are able to point to and say, there's God, there's God, there's the spirit. Jesus, Jesus just showed up. And my prayer is that you will continue to be refreshed in your mission and ministry as you help lead uh, our congregations um, in this time and place. So go with lots of grace and I hope lots of peace and joy. <laughs>